ash, red maple, black gum. How often the names of trees consoled me. How I would repeat to myself, green ash, while the marriage smoldered in the not talking. Red maple, when the less than tenderness flashed. Then black gum, black gum, as I lay next to you in the not sleeping, in the not love making. Those days I tramped the morass of the preserve, ancient ash smudging shadows on stagnant pools, the few wintry souls of skulking abandoned wharves. In my notebook I copied plaques screwed to bark, sketching the trunk scission, a minor Audubon bearing loneliness like a rucksack. And did the trees assume a deeper silence? Did their gravity and burl and centuries-old patience dignify this country, our sorrow? So as I lay there, the roof bursting with invisible branches, the darkness doubling in their shade, the accusations turning truths in the not loving. Green ash, red maple, black gum, I prayed, in the never been faithful, in the don't touch me, in the can't bear it any longer. Black gum, black gum, black gum. When I was a boy, my father um, introduced me to poetry by reading um, to me uh, the poems of Robert Service, um, uh, especially the cremation of Sam McGee. There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. And I remember not knowing, of course, what a word like moil meant um, at that time. I'm not sure I still know if I know what it means now. But um, that whole uh, idea of just that language sawing and taking off um, and being able to repeat those sounds. Um, and the sense too of, of a beginning. Where was that poem going to go? A story had been started and there was that sense of possibility and promise that was um, um, inherent in those lines. It's that I always wanted to lean forward with them, tumble forward with those, with those words. And so I, I think that's where uh, poetry began for me and I'm grateful to my father who was a, a, a fireman. But certainly my father's, my father's love for that poetry and his willingness and patience to share that with me um, is what triggered um, that response and affinity in me. So that when I was in the fifth and sixth grades, um, I was writing my own poems for the first time, little rhymed and metered pieces, and generally about, you know, in praise of the East New York Savings Bank, say. Um, but at the same time, that's where it, where it began. Every time I think of a definition of poetry, um, the definition changes. And a as a practicing writer, I don't think of defining poetry very often. Um, but if I had to come up with a definition at this moment, I guess I would think that poetry is the expression of or the creation of a whole being, including all aspects of personality, um, when that poem is being written. Um, when the poem is being written, I guess, when the poem is being put upon the page. Um, and those aspects of personality would be intellectual and emotional, certainly, but also spiritual and uh, psychological. And there should be some sort of balance. And I think poets tend to divide themselves uh, between those who might favor the intellectual aspect of personality as opposed to those who favor the, uh, say, emotional aspect. Um, and my own work tends to go back toward, toward the emotional, I guess, towards um, um, the poetry of feeling um, that Wordsworth was so fond of. But I think any good poet is going to strike some sort of balance um, among those aspects. I'm not sure how I go at a poem. Um, generally, I tend not to work with idea. I tend to start with either um, an image or a musical phrase or um, the language itself um, and let the language play a bit until it begins to assume some sort of shape and some sort of meaning. Um, for me those two are um, inextricable. Um, I don't think I can begin to simply put down a poem, draft a poem, uh, without being conscious of uh, the shape that it wants to take. At the same time um, I think it's impossible to simply uh, begin with shape but not have any idea of what one is saying. And so the two things seem to work hand in hand. And I work very slowly, always just on one poem at a time. 
and I tend to craft the poem line by line by line. I'm very conscious of um, what I think of as the integrity of the poetic line. And I believe that poems are always made up of lines, that those are um, the integral units, say, of poetry. Um, but in the process of revision, if I change one word, even a syllable, somewhere, say, in line two, it seems to have this sort of shuffleboard effect, um, or tote board effect, I should say, where everything is shuffled all of a sudden. And a change on line two certainly affects line 16 or line 28, whatever it may be. And so the process of revision has to include that. It's not removing one thing and plugging in, say, another word. Um, but it, it winds up reshaping your thought and reshaping the language of the poem. And, so, and that's where the real writing seems to, seems to get done, not this sort of spontaneous outburst uh, and then starting to shape that, but instead um, um, the slow crafting of language while one is uh, revising, I guess, thought at the same time. Uh, again, those two things working always with each other. <laughs> Good poetry is always is music. Um, uh, but, but when we talk about music, that's not quite the term, and any musician um, who would be listening to this, um, or anyone who knows anything about musical composition would probably be um, offended. But certainly there's an arrangement of language in which the sounds of that language um, are, are, um, become, become palpable. Um, so that when one says a, a good line of poetry, one feels those words um, moving in the mouth. Um, I think of poets in our time like John Logan and Isabella Gardner, then, who in crafting a line of poetry remember the sensual pleasure that language gives beyond sense or before sense. Um, remembering too um, children's attractions uh, to, to nursery rhymes um, and how they love to repeat certain phrases, nonsensical as they may be, over and over again because of that sensual pleasure that comes from saying that. So when I listen to some lines by someone like John Logan um, talking about ducks, they live on swill, our aged houseboats spill, but still they are beautiful. Look, the duck with its unlikely beak has stopped to pick and pull at the potted daffodil. Um, language like that seems to me to be transcendent, and that seems to me to be where poetry comes in, that combination of sound and sense, and that sheer uh, or pure uh, uh, sensual pleasure that comes both from um, uh, the pronunciation of those syllables and the delight in the way that those syllables come together to uh, create an idea. Not too many things distinguish poetry from prose. Certainly, um, I, would say, I would say two things for sure. One is that um, what we called, for lack of a better word, music, let's say sound work that we were just talking about. Euphony would be the, the technical term for it. Um, but the main thing that distinguishes poetry from prose is that poetry is written in lines and prose is not. Prose is written in sentences. And um, uh, beginning poets tend generally to write sentences and chop them up and feel that there's poetry there. Um, but that, that's not how it works. Finally, what we, went, we end up with is a, is a chopped up sentence. Um, but if one begins to, um, in, in the process of writing the poem, pay attention to the line as that integral unit and, um, and begins to create a texture down the page and across the page as we move from one line to the next, um, then that's where poetry seems to come from. Um, people who write prose poems tend to make use of the elements of fiction, but not all of them. Let's, say, let's agree that the elements of fiction are character, setting, and plot. Most prose poems make use, let's say, of setting. Some prose poems, um, a famous prose poem is Robert Haas's uh, A Story About the Body. There's a, there's, there's a little piece of prose that makes use of character and plot and, in fact, setting. Um, Robert Bly's poems his prose poems about his children, for example, make use of character. Most of his poems, though, make use primarily of, of setting. Um, poetry makes use generally of all of the elements of fiction, unless you're working solely with the lyric mode. Um, but one is working with lines. I remember when um, Charles Simich won a Pulitzer Prize in 
for a book of prose poems, Louis Simpson wrote a, a somewhat bemused and angry letter to the New York Times um, saying if the committee had wanted to award this book um, uh, as fiction, that would be one thing. But since it's um, not written in lines, it can't be poetry. And I tend to agree with that. So what does distinguish poetry from prose? Lineation. What gives line its integrity? Yeah, that's, that's tough, and that's something poets wrestle with all the time. Um, some people might think that the integral unit of, of a poem might be the unit of breath, or it might be a, a syntactical unit then. Um, but it seems to me that, um, that poems are broken up into lines, of course. So those are, those, those are the units. A line needs to be balanced in some way. Um, we have so much language that we tend to gloss over. Articles, um, prepositions, conjunctions, all of those little words that seem to stay in the background of any, of any work of art, poetry or, or prose. Um, and it's the poet's job to bring even those words through usage, through sound work, into the foreground so that each word seems essential. We have this notion of democracy when it comes to poetry. And we get this notion, of course, from our great American poet, Walt Whitman. And Whitman brought democracy into the content of his poems. Um, he, would, he, would, he would write an inclusive poetry that not only made use of the language of the common man, what Whitman called the blab of the pave, but he wrote about the common man as well, the runaway slave, the syphilitic prostitute, um, the fur trapper and his um, red bride. Almost uh, a half century later, um, we have William Carlos Williams um, taking that notion of democracy, but instead working with it in terms of form rather than with content. And so instead of Whitman say all men are created equal, um, what Williams works with is the notion that all words are created equal. And he tries to find a means on the page to make sure that, again, each word counts, whether it's visually, whether it's through sound, whether it's through um, um, some sort of pronunciation, so that in terms of setting up, let's say, some sort of rhyme, even though Williams primarily wrote free verse, um, he might make you hear the sound of one three-syllable word along with, say, the sounds of three one-syllable words and having you have to say them separately like that brings them into the foreground of the poem. Uh, Williams, of course, was terrifically influenced by so many of the painters of the day, painters who were friends of his, um, Marsden Hartley, for example, Charles Sheeler, um, and they were concerned with what was new um, and what was happening in Europe at the time, um, uh, the advent of Cubism, for example, when all of a sudden the surface of the painting is fragmented and broken up into planes, and for the most part, background is suddenly eliminated, and everything is moved into the foreground now. So Williams, who was hanging around the Daniel Art Gallery in, in New York, um, for example, who had gone to the 1913 Armory Show and had seen nude descending a staircase, um, he talks in his autobiography about that show and walking around laughing um, uh, ecstatically. Um, he got everything right away and wondering how he could bring these techniques of painting into, into his poetry. Um, and he was concerned too with the fact that these techniques reminded the viewer what, of what paintings uh, were made um, rather than presenting a, a window into a world as a landscape, as a traditional landscape, say, did, um, suddenly you would go into a museum and be stopped by what you saw on the wall rather than invited into it. And you would recognize that what you were seeing was a construct made up of, of canvas and oil. Um, and so you would be aware of the components of the painting as well as what the painting meant to convey, the information that the painting meant to convey. And so Williams also wanted to convey information in poems, but at the same time make you aware that they are constructs of language. And one of the stories he tells in his autobiography is being at that Daniel Gallery with its proprietor, a man named, um, if memory serves me well, Charles Hartpence, and um, a woman, a patron of the arts, coming in and looking at the paintings and focusing on one 
and walking over and looking at it, stepping back, looking at it again, stepping back, and finally turning and saying, Mr. Hartpence, what is that in the left-hand corner of the painting? And Hartpence replied, Madam, it's paint. Well, Williams loved that. And he would say, I think, it's words, it's language, all right? And we need to keep that in mind. Um, there's an unpublished and undated um, essay by Williams in, um, uh, I think it's, what is it, the Lockwood Library, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe the Beinecke, but um, where he talks about reading poetry backwards um, so that one forgets the sense of the poem but pays attention simply to the language and to the line then. Um, and I like that idea very much. Um, a good line of poetry, it seems to me, needs to be packed. Um, each word, again, should count in some way. Um, at the same time, there needs to be some sort of balance to the line and some sort of sensual pleasure, again, to the sound of the words. The lines need to connect with every line that, 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 that's come before them in the poem and with all of those lines that are going to follow. Um, so that that texture is created and so that the poem moves not only down the page vertically but also horizontally or not only horizontally as most poems tend to do as we move from left to right swing down with that turn and begin again let's say um, but there should be a vertical movement so that um, a sound we hear let's say in line 16 um, or a word um, triggers for us again um, a sound or a word um, in line two, so that the whole poem is kept in front of us at all times. Then. And that seems to be the work of the poet, and that seems to be part of the purpose of, of lineation, too, or part of the use of lineation. Um, poetry goes back, of course, before prose, and the idea of conveying information, giving the history of the tribe, say, um, stories of great battles, tales of heroes, um, this would, this would be handed down generation to generation. And generally, meter and rhyme would be those devices used so that these poems would stay in, one's, in, in, in the memory of the tribe. Um, then, then we have the written word, finally, and printing presses. Um, and so we have, we have other ways, suddenly, of, um, of, of listening uh, and remembering. Um, and then in our century, we move toward free verse. But um, Robert Bly thinks of it as free verse with distinct memories of form. And I believe Donald Hall has said something about free verse has nothing to do finally with being free or with, with liberty then. Um, but we need to find um, for each poem um, its own organic structure. But that structure need to be in the poem. Otherwise, otherwise it's going to sprawl a bit and it's going to have no... no um, <sighs> No integrity, I guess, is what I want to say. And so, um, but that's something I think that poets, many poets, uh, have largely forgotten um, in our century as we've been crafting free verse lines. And uh, what we've been trying to do maybe is find a way to put that craft um, or discover what the craft might be for free verse. And it's taken us so far almost, almost a century, it seems. Where there's always that sense of having to begin again when a poem is finished because there are no rules except those rules that the poem establishes when it's in the process of being created. I don't remember the name of the story, but the hero, a boy, was lost, wandering a labyrinth of caverns, a filling stratum by stratum with water. I was wondering what might happen. Would he float upward toward light? Or would he somersault forever in an underground black river? I couldn't stop reading the book because I had to know the answer. Because my mother was leaving again. The lid of the trunk thrown open. Blouses torn from their hangers. And the crazy shouting among rooms. The boy found it impossible to see which passage led to safety. One yellow finger of flame wavered on his last match. There was a blur of perfume, mother breaking miniature bottles, then my father gripping her, but too tightly, by both arms. The boy wasn't able to breathe. I think he wanted me to help, but I was small, and it was late. And my mother was sobbing now, 
no longer cursing her life, repeating my father's name among bright islands of skirts circling the rim of the bed. I can't recall the whole story, what happened at the end. Sometimes I worry that the boy is still searching below the earth for a thin pencil of light, that I can almost hear him through great volumes of water or through centuries of stone, crying my name among blind fish and wanting so much to come home.